approach to teaching students about research, which is what this uh, afternoon is about, right? Yes. A 3D printer. Yes, this is a 3D printed. Actually, uh, they printed in Milwaukee. They have a very nice 3D printer that can print with different materials and also different colors. Can you say the yes. students did the 3D printing? Um, the school in engineering, the, the Milwaukee School of Engineering is creating the models, but the students are actually programming it on the screen. So they virtually create the models and then save the rendering style that they achieve their computer graphics into a file and then in Milwaukee, they take that file and transform it into a three-dimensional model. So all the creative work is done by the students. Okay, so, so this is just a mindless machine in Milwaukee that's creating these models, but you have to be creative first and create them on the computer screen. So what you see here is actually being created by some students. Okay, here at Pingree High School. Um, so this is just an example where technologies that were traditionally used in like gaming, you know, in 3D printing, the tradition used in, in other sectors really can transform uh, research and education. And, uh, but traditionally, it used to be the other way around, as I mentioned. So I'll just give you a very, very brief history of computer graphics because we don't have much time. But um, it started, essentially, computer graphics started with uh, military uh, air defense work during the Cold War. So because uh, in the 1950s, it was a big push to improve uh, the air defense network in the United States. And for the first time, uh, these uh, radar displays were created. And uh, the idea was to interact with them uh, with a light gun. And later in 1963, uh, the first interactive GUI where you can draw on a screen was invented by Ivan Sutherland um, at MIT. And what was interesting at the time is that they used these light pens. So how do you think these light pens worked at the time? Were they like a real pen? Could you write with them on the screen? What do you think? How do you think the light pen works? Yes? Right. Is it actually emitting light or is it recording light? What do you think? Recording. So it's, it's a sensor, right? It's sensing light. And, and how can you position an object in, in X, Y on the screen to get the coordinates? It has to do with the old CRT uh, cathode ray tube uh, displays where you had some electron beam that was scanning the surface of the screen surface with a certain frequency, certain refresh rate. And then based on some uh, sim blocking of your pen with the refresh rate of the electron beam, you could time exactly when that beam would hit your sensor. That would give you the X and Y coordinates because it would scan the surface of the screen, right? And that's, of course, uh, happening very rapidly, so it's invisible to the eye, but the uh, sensor picks up the signal and can tell you where you're located. And this way you can interact with the objects in a virtual world on the computer directly. And that was the first time this was uh, invented, it was really in the 1960s, if you imagine. Uh, and then later, um, some more fancy contractions were uh, developed Mostly envisioned by Martin Heilig in 61 and 62. He essentially uh, invented this apparatus, which is the so-called Sensorama, which was the first immersive virtual reality display, where you could have uh, 3D vision, um, motion uh, experience, uh, color, uh, stereo sound, uh, uh, wind and vibrations. And you could even smell aromas uh, in some aroma device that was uh, implemented there. So it really tried to create a very immersive experience. Unfortunately, commercially, this was a huge flop, but it was developed in the 1960s by Martin Heilig, who was a pioneer in virtual reality. And then he also invented the head-mounted display, which is now used in some uh, gaming applications. Okay, so, and then later, when I was a student uh, at the University of Illinois, um, in Chicago, at the Chicago campus of U of I, uh, the cave was invented, uh, which is a, a truly immersive uh, room size, uh, a display where you're surrounded by walls and the computer takes care of the rendering on each of the walls. And then the, you have typically a, an active stereo glasses uh, with LCD shutters that would synchronize the, the, the image that you perceive on each of your eyes uh, with what is being displayed. So you have the 3D perception. But also the geometry of the walls and the shading 
uh, in the corners, the minute team has to be taken into account to feel a true immersive experience. So that was done actually by, that was invented and implemented by students, uh, who were graduate students at the time at University of Illinois in Chicago. So this shows you really how students can make a difference and, and change the world. Uh, and it wasn't the professors, it was actually students who had all these uh, innovative engineering ideas that had really changed how we go about visualization nowadays. And then my personal work at that time, and I was a student 20 years ago, 1994, I was at the University of Illinois in the Urbana-Champaign campus, uh, physics grad student, and our lab was the first one that had a 3D uh, uh, virtual reality uh, system implemented at the Beckman Institute, and this is shown in this newspaper article here. Uh, this is me 20 years ago. <laughs> I still had some hair at the time, or more hair. And these guys are now very famous um, uh, software engineers and developers. And who darkly developed a VMD program that is shown here that now most of the people in the scientific community use for 3D modeling of biomolecules. So there are hundreds of thousands of users worldwide for this type of um, work. Um, Tom Bishop is now a professor at, uh, in, in Louisiana, and uh, Bill Humphrey is also a successful programmer. He uh, has uh, developed a NAMD market dynamics program that is widely used in uh, molecular modeling, which I still use now in New York in my work, my day-to-day -day job, okay? So um, a few years later, 10 years ago, that was 20 years ago, now moving to 10 years ago, I had my own lab at the University of Texas. And what do we do? There were no 3D televisions at the time on the market. So we built our own. We built this rear projection system where you can see two projectors, these DLP projectors, projecting an image onto the screens, and you had a folded light path, and they were projecting two images simultaneously onto the surface. And these images were polarized with a polarizing filter, and then you would wear these very inexpensive polarizing glasses, which you can now wear with 3D tele televisions also and get the three-dimensional uh, picture. So that's what inspired me to move into molecular modeling. And you can see how computer graphics had a big role in sort of how I trained and developed as a scientist. Even though most of our applications are in the medical field and in, in molecular modeling of biomolecules, okay? So we do serious science, but we use some of these technologies for interacting with the computers for generating better models uh, and um, better quality uh, results in our predictions. Uh, another area that interested me is animation, computer animation. Uh, and one particular uh, subfield of interest is motion capture technology that's used in the movie and entertainment industry where, where they're actually taking skeletons in the computer that are fitted to three-dimensional positions that are tracked based on uh, trackers on human actors. Uh, so you have these um, position detectors in space, and they're measuring the motions of the actors, and then the motion is digitized, and the skeletons are being fitted to these positions. And then you can animate um, uh, computer graphics, video animations, with human-like motion, because it's very hard to actually mimic the human motion of the human body. So that's why they use these skeletons and this motion capture technology. And one movie that was very successful that used this was um, the Polar Express, um, 10 years ago, with, uh, uh, that was done with Tom Hanks as the main actor. He actually played all the characters in this animated movie. And the way this was done was that they used motion capture, so they captured all of his um, uh, human motions and implemented them in the movie. And he was actually really acting all of the characters in, in single-handedly as a single actor in this uh, animated movie, which is quite remarkable. Um, and this was also done with motion capture technology. So I, I was inspired by this and I thought, okay, let's use this idea for modeling motion in biomolecular structures. Okay, so this is, so we developed a technique called motion capture network, which describes the shape and complexity of, a, um, um, in this case, a virus capsid or some other biomolecular assembly, and gets the essential information about the shape and, and, and distances uh, by looking at the position of these vertices and connecting them and creating some sort of network. And then this network can follow the, sh the motion as this uh, virus capsule is undergoing a conformational change. And I'm showing here an animation uh, based on a grow L molecule. I hope I can close this a little bit. 
So what is shown here is how the virus caps it was at Rho AL molecule. Uh, this is a molecular assembly that consists of 14 subunits. And this movie shows you the wild type, um, which is very rugged. And now this, this is a mutant of the same molecule imaged in electron microscopy at low resolution. You see that these apical domains are flat. And there's a huge conformation change taking place. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to model that conformation change at atomic detail, but we only have this low resolution image from an electron microscope in 3D. We, we don't have an atomic model of this conformation change. And so this, this is where we use the motion capture technology. We take an atomic structure and then represent this atomic structure with these skeletons. Okay, 14 of these skeletons represent the shape, which is a these skeletons are roughly at the same resolution as the, den the, the density map here in this movie. And then um, these skeletons are fitted first to the atomic structure and then also to the EM uh, map in the other state. And thereby it gives us a reduced model of the deformation, the displacement. And this motion can then be implemented in the, in the computer and you can animate the conformational change by using a molecular dynamics program to interpolate between the state A and state B. Okay, I only have like uh, five to ten minutes. Okay, so this is the motion that we can produce with this molecular dynamics program. It gives you an idea of what this motion capture technology can achieve. Okay, so it's another example of how we can get inspired by some ideas from movies, entertainment, computer games, and apply these concepts in science. Uh, another example is molecular visualization. I'm interested in rendering biomolecules uh, realistically with correct shading. Uh, to create an image like this uh, takes actually a very long time, uh, several hours on a computer workstation, uh, because even with modern graphics cards and, and what have you, mainly because of the ray tracing that is involved to create a, a, a realistic shading uh, of these objects uh, that, that is very, very time consuming. And uh, so what people used to do in the past is just localize shading where they basically render shading of each atom, each sphere in this model uh, individually, but you can see that the appearance is very flat, okay, of these models. Uh, and, uh, but the computer game industry really came to the rescue here, because uh, recently there's a new trend that has been developed in computer gaming, which is called ambient occlusion. This is a method that was first implemented in 2007 in the Windows game crisis, by Vladimir Kajolin. And it really caught on like uh, wildfire. Everybody's using this technology now because it enables you to do a quasi-realistic rendering in real time on the computer screen of the shading that, that takes place. And it's done in a way where you approximate the, the shading by some model that depends on a sphere um, that is rolling on the surface in the Z direction. When you look down, in, into the image, there's a Z buffer that tells you about the depth of your scene. And when you let some sphere roll on the scene in the Z direction, that can be implemented very efficiently, you can then count how many pixels are occupied and open. And based on this, you can just sort of guesstimate how much ambient light reaches that particular point. And that gives you then an almost realistic um, appearance of the uh, lighting with, you know, with very, very inexpensive uh, calculation that can be done on a CPU or a graphics card in real time. So here's an example in our modeling. So we implemented this technique in our uh, Sculptor program, which you can download on the internet. And you can see the old style rendering, of course, which doesn't work for very big systems because you don't have any shading here, just using the local shading based on the atomic structures. And this gives you then the realistic shading of the virus capsid surface. And the same is shown here in this class rate cage, okay? So again, it's an example where innovations in um, entertainment industry are driving uh, scientific breakthroughs as well, or visualization breakthroughs as they are being applied to uh, you know, molecular rendering. So with this, I would like to end. And uh, if you want to try this program that I just mentioned, Sculptor, uh, it can do a lot more than I had time to talk about. It's also performing haptic rendering, so force feedback, so you can actually you know, interact with bar molecules and feel the forces of the interactions. Um, and um, this program is actually quite useful for docking of bar molecules in a virtual way. We also use it for building bar molecular assemblies, sim similar to this 3D model. 
that you have seen. We built that virtually in the computer. And um, by feeling the interactions and also allowing you to be creative about the rendering, uh, you can really create very sophisticated images for visualization purposes, movies, and also three-dimensional models that can then be printed, as you've seen here. And so with this, I would like to conclude. I, I left some extra time because I felt that there would be some questions probably about uh, career choices, right, in, in biomolecular modeling and computing. So I'll give you that opportunity if you have any questions. Yes? It's not a career question, more uh, just toys. Um, have you played with D-Wave or any of the Oculus Rift stuff that's mm -hmm. out there now? You mean the have the Yeah, or even the D-Wave quantum, quantum computers? Right, in the olden days, people used to get nauseous and then uh, you, you would not have a very good, pleasant experience. And so I believe in, not in an entirely virtual world where the, end, the complete world is virtual, but I think the most interesting science happens when you have an interface between a human interaction and the virtual environment. So you probably know about augmented reality, right? Where you basically take a real scene and superimpose some, some 3D object on it. And it. It's almost like they both exist in the same space. Well, we do the opposite. We use, I would like to call it augmented virtuality. We use the um, computer, the black box, and augment it with human input, expert input. Then let the human experts drive the computational results. And that is done through force feedback, for example. You can do that. You get some soft feedback from the computer about what would be the suggested locations of possible docking positions, poses, and how the parts of an assembly will fit together. And then, about you as an expert, you know how the biological structure should look like. And you can override this and impose your own constraints in the modeling. So I believe in these type of interactions, and they require you to have some sort of um, a simultaneous rendering of, you know, and you have to have a human computer interaction that's not just purely virtual, but you actually are physically present in a room with the computer, you interact with it through some haptic device. So that's sort of my philosophy that uh, I would like to add uh, the experience. Uh, in the physical realm to just uh, the image. And I believe that this is very important. But so, so we're not producing games per se, but this is serious science. It's really, I mean, this program that I showed you is used by 3,000 people around the world. Uh, and we have, uh, we had in the past NIH support for the National Institutes of Health for the development. And I'm trying to reestablish my program now that I'm moving to Virginia, you know. And so this is a serious science project and we're going to apply for funding for it. And uh, they don't tend to like uh, just pure, you know, fun type projects just for the benefit of having a good time. So they want to see some real outcomes. And we can show that this type of, you know, what I've shown you before, there's some real outcomes that are really convincing. We can really show them that we make a difference with our development. So that's what they're looking for, some real innovations and, and real progress in the medical field, you know, in, in, in molecular modeling. Yes? They say you can look at interactions. Uh, do they have to be known interactions, or can they predict? Speaker presentations in room 302 and 306 are starting in five minutes. Thank you. Pardon me? Uh, can they predict uh, docking sites? So, yeah. So, okay. So one thing you want to do is put the physics in there, too. So uh, what is more about the chemistry of the interactions and the electrostatics, you know, you can, do, you can put models of that into you know, rendering. Right now we have mostly the geometry that's, that's been used for our fitting. Um, there's some reason for that, mainly because our customers are electron microscopists. And they, do, they tend not to believe the physics too much in the chemistry. But they really believe the shape of the molecules they see. And the reason is that they, their particles are actually immersed in detergent, so there's other things that are stuck to the surface. So we're not really sure, <coughs> excuse me, about the uh, electrostatics, because there might be ions binding to the surface. <coughs> and other, <coughs> excuse me, other particles. I'm a bit under the weather, so. <laughs> anyway, I, it's really a pleasure to be here. And any more questions, I'm, I'm going to give another presentation later at uh, uh, 2.30. Yes.